Hi, I'm David Cunnington, and I'm here with Dr. Claire Ellender, who's a sleep fellow who's working together with me at Melbourne Sleep Disorder Centre. And we're going to talk to you a bit about how the pituitary interacts with sleep and some of the things we think about when we're seeing people with pituitary problems who've got problems with their sleep. So having a look at how the pituitary gland interacts with sleep, certainly if we're having a look at the, the anatomy of it, there's lots of associations of the pituitary gland with structures that control sleep. Before we sort of go into uh, all of the anatomy side of things, it's really interesting to try and make a definition of what sleep is. It's, um, you know, different things to different people. If you think about it yourself, sleep is when you've got quietening of the body, quietening of the mind, not aware of what's going on around you. And when we see it um, in another person, we see them being quite still, um, lying down often, not a lot of movement in their body. Um, there's restorative functions to sleep, you know, helping to reset some of the chemicals in the brain uh, and in the body as well. And then when we're looking at sleep studies in the sleep lab, there's specific findings that we, we look for in the brain activities and the muscle activities um, to actually define sleep. So it's a pretty tricky thing to actually, you know, put in a sentence and say exactly what it is. So it's not surprising when I show you this picture of a brain here that there's lots of different structures that are involved. So there's uh, the filter that sort of filters out a lot of the information coming in from your senses, uh, your, your hearing as well as your body position, and that's one of the roles of the thalamus and sort of an important filter. In terms of uh, being that feeling of wakefulness versus sleepiness, the hypothalamus is very important with that. It's the site where there's a, a buildup of hormones and, and um, different proteins and chemicals in the body during the day. And that sort of um, helps uh, the combination of all of these and the balance of them influences uh, the feeling of sleepiness versus wakefulness during the day. Uh, the cerebrum uh, or the cortex, as it's also known, is uh, where a lot of our thinking and our fine motor skills go on. And so they're all in similar areas around the body. And there's a very important structure that we'll talk a little bit more about um, uh, in a few minutes uh, called the pineal gland. And that's um, a gland that makes a very important hormone called melatonin. Uh, and that's one of the master switches uh, between day and night and the, and the body clock. Uh, that sort of governs a lots of lots of other areas of the body, um, including things like uh, control of blood pressure, uh, influences um, insulin sensitivity, and also uh, influences the release of other hormones like cortisol hormone. The sort of minute by minute and um, control of sleep is by something called the homeostatic sleep drive, uh, and, and that is mainly controlled in the hypothalamus. Uh, which is very near the pituitary gland you can see here in this picture and th these structures here uh, are then controlling sleep through night um, and there's stages of sleep that we go through and this picture here shows us, us sort of over time down here on the bottom axis the different stages of sleep stage one and two sleep tend to be your lighter sleep and stage three sleep tends to be the deeper sleep where a lot of uh, hormonal um, release is, is regulated, such as growth hormone. Um, and most people in a normal situation would go through every 90 minutes a cycle from the lighter sleep down to the stage three sleep and then have periods of dreaming sleep um, or REM sleep, which is when the muscles are paralyzed. So there's, there's cycles that we all go through um, during a normal night's sleep. So normal sleep is a balance between the hormones um, and the pathways that make us feel sleepy and the balance of turning those on and uh, turning uh, off the wakefulness pathways and sort of a balance between the two in the normal situation. And overriding those sort of uh, shorter term mechanisms I spoke about before, there's something called the circadian rhythm, which is that master body clock, the 24 hour clock. And uh, the circadian rhythm uh, gets triggered off by the release of a hormone from that pineal gland we saw earlier. 
and that controls the balance between sleep and wake, but it also controls a number, number of other uh, pathways, such as the release of hormones like cortisol, um, our temperature, COX as well. Um, things involved in metabolism um, like insulin sensitivity and diabetes uh, and also blood pressure control. So it's a really important major, a major sort of switch and pathway. In, time, in terms of the types of sleep disorders we see, um, one of the most common ones you might have heard about fall under the category of um, sleep-related breathing, breathing disorders. And uh, lots of us have heard of um, OSA or obstructive sleep apnea. You might know a friend who's on a CPAP machine. I'll show you some pictures about that uh, a little bit later. There's also some disorders where the signal down from the brain to tell us to breathe at night time can go a little awry, and that's something called central sleep apnea. Um, and there's complex interactions in that in people when they carry a bit much weight as well. And we, we know that as obesity hyperventilation syndrome. Insomnia is something a lot of us have heard about and suffered over our lifetimes, and that's a category in its own, right? And we, you know, there's different types of insomnia. Um, so that's certainly an important type of sleep disorder. Those body clocks I mentioned earlier um, can go a little um, out of whack as well. And so there's a whole um, category of uh, different disorders with the circadian rhythm, that body clock rhythm. Um, we classify them as circadian rhythm disorders. Um, some people have problems with controlling the boundary, boundaries between wake and sleep um, and uh, are really sleepy during the day. That's uh, uh, disorders of um, hypersomnia. And then I'm sure we would have met someone around the traps who's had some sleepwalking or sleep talking. They fall under a category called parasomnias. And finally, some is a category of sleep disorders um, called movement disorders, things like the restless leg syndrome um, that you might know someone who, who has. Um, and these are the major categories that we see of different types of sleep disorders. So the common pituitary disorders uh, that also have um, uh, associated sleep disorders um, fall under sort of two main categories. So you can have difficulties where uh, there's um, too much hormone production. Um, and then there's another category where the pituitary gland gets enlarged and it causes a physical, or we call it a mass effect, um, squashing other structures. So with the um, functioning um, uh, problems where the, there's too much hormone production. Um, there's three main hormones that can cause um, problems with sleep. Um, one of the most common ones is acromegaly, and that's uh, a disorder where the pituitary is making too much of growth hormone or the precursor hormone that um, tells the body to make growth hormone. And that can lead to the obstructive sleep apnea, and we'll talk a little bit more about how that happens. You can also get um, central sleep apneas as well. Uh, Cushing's disease, um, which is uh, too much cortisol or ACTH, uh, the precursor, that can also cause um, obstructive sleep apnea. Um, and problems with thyroid secreting tumours um, and, and structures can lead to difficulties with maintaining or initiating sleep, and that's um, characterised by insomnia. And then certainly there are conditions where the mass effect can squash the, the um pineal gland and that's that gland involved in the body clock rhythm uh, and causing circadian rhythm problems. And sleep actually can also have an impact back on um, both the hypothalamus and the pituitary and that access the interaction between the two. Um, uh, for example in people with sleep apnea they can tr have trouble with their um, sex hormone secretions and also, um, if you're not getting enough of that deeper sleep, the slow wave sleep, it can influence the amount of growth hormone that your body makes. So there's interactions both ways. I've mentioned uh, obstructive sleep apnea a couple of times, um, but it'd probably be good for me to explain a little bit about what that is. Um, so obstructive sleep apnea is a problem where when people are off to sleep at night, uh, they get relaxation of the muscles in their upper airway um, and the tongue is one of those um, big muscles that is in and around the airway. Uh, and relaxation as sleep comes on leads to uh, the muscles relaxing and, and narrowing down, the tongue flopping back and causing there to be uh, less air be, being able to get down into the lungs. Um, and that's the obstruction part, like the, the tongue flopping back and the air pipe narrowing down. And 
not enough oxygen getting down into uh, the lungs lead to, leads to there being not enough oxygen uh, getting to the brain at night time. And there's lots of signals and lots of receptors that the brain has, of course, to be able to register that. And when that's noticed by the brain, uh, a big alert system gets sent off, a big surge of activity in the brain, sending some activity to those muscles to put tone back in those muscles. And that leads to then people getting activity in their brain when they should be asleep. So not getting a nice restorative quality night's sleep. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the principles of sleep apnea. Yeah. And some of the common things I see people uh, present with or the symptoms people get either with sleep apnea or other sleep problems with pituitary problems is feeling more tired during the day than they'd expect, even though they're getting adequate amounts of sleep or feeling that they're sleeping reasonably well. Or sometimes it can be trouble getting to sleep, trouble staying asleep, or not sleeping at the right time. So that's often a sign of the circadian rhythm problems where people can't get to sleep at the time they want to get to sleep or can't wake up at the time they want to wake up. Less commonly with pituitary problems, but we do see them, is movement disorders during sleep where people get involuntary movements, either of the legs or um, other limbs. Uh, and sometimes it'll just be an observer saying that you know, this person's restless, moving around a lot, and the person who's got the problem may actually be unaware of it. Acromegaly um, is really uh, quite commonly associated with obstructive sleep apnea. So depending on what um, study you look at, uh, some of the original studies, uh, they found about 20% of people having sleep apnea. But in the more, more um, modern studies, there's more like uh, two-thirds of people or more having uh, obstructive sleep apnea. So certainly a common association. And why is that? Well, sleep apnea in uh, acromegaly is common because there's often enlargement of the mandible. There's often uh, slightly different shaped um, jaws and, uh, and that means that often there's crowding of the back of the throat. Um, the tissues tend to be enlarged because of the influence of growth hormone on soft tissues uh, like muscles and fat and that squashes your airway and your windpipe as well. Um, the t strength in those uh, areas tends to be a bit weaker so you're more likely when you take a big breath in to have collapse down of the air pipe and that can lead to um, air not being able to get in which is one of the main problems in obstructive sleep apnea. The tongue can certainly get very big you often see in people with um, acromegaly lots of teeth marks on the side of their tongues so that's sort of a, a really key giveaway sign that we look for. Um, big uh, enlarged thyroid glands or uh, something called a multinodular goiter can be seen that sort of also can put some pressure on the windpipe and carrying too much too much weight uh, in anyone is a bit of a risk factor for sleep apnea but particularly in people with acromegaly um, associated sleep apnea. So if you're having a look at uh, the back of the mouth, we've got the big tongue contributing to sleep apnea, crowding from those increased tissues. Uh, so it's no wonder that there's a really strong association between these two conditions. Acromegaly um, also can lead to that central sleep apnea I mentioned. Um, central sleep apnea is that under breathing problem uh, where the message doesn't get down from the brain well. And in acromegaly, uh, the levels of um, growth hormone and the precursor um, can sort of lead to cyclical underbreathing, so the the message is not getting down properly, and then the message not getting back up properly. So problems with the the feedback me mechanism. So you kind of got a two pronged um, difficulty in getting the signal down to breathe properly, and that can lead to people having really poor quality sleep, either from the signal not getting through properly and then oxygen levels falling and the brain getting really stimulated as sort of a panic response through the night from that low oxygen level. Um, and also from the sort of forces on the body um, overnight from that under breathing uh, leads to the brain not getting that restorative deep quality sleep um, that makes people feel refreshed. Um, Interestingly, uh, the different types of sleep apnea tend to respond differently when um, the problem in the pituitary is treated. So the central sleep apneas, that under-breathing from the, the signal problem, um, that does tend to improve uh, as biochemical control of the hormones um, is achieved. Um, 
Whereas interestingly, the obstructive type, with the problem with the mechanics and the blocking from the big t uh, tissues and, and problems with the structures, that uh, doesn't always improve um, despite getting good control of hormone levels. So one of the predictors is really um, if your um, tongue volume gets smaller over time, that's more likely to help. Um, and if your uh, jaw structure changes, improves, that's uh, some, those two things are most strongly associated with obstructive type of sleep apnea getting better controlled. So it's one of the reasons why we always follow people up um, after they've had treatment for their um, pituitary disorders to make sure uh, if they've got a response and if not, then make sure they're on the right therapy. Cushing's disease is also um, associated with obstructive sleep apnea. Um, it's through the mechanisms I mentioned earlier, but um, also obesity is a, a really uh, important risk factor um, in the relationship between Cushing's disease and sleep apnea. Um, some of those other mechanical structures are not quite so much of an issue. Um, and this is something that we really like to make sure we screen for and provide good quality um, treatment advice for our patients because um, both sleep apnea and Cushing's disease um, increases the risk of cardiovascular uh, disease in patients. Um, so the combination of the two can lead to um, serious increase in the risk of cardiovascular disease. So things like heart attacks and strokes. We also um, can see insomnia in our patients who have Cushing's disease from that high level of cortisol. Um, and we, we think that two of the mechanisms might be, uh, first of all, that um, there's less slow wave sleep, so that deeper sleep, and also less sleep efficiency. So of the amount of time that you're spending in bed, the amount of time you're actually asleep is less. And so people uh, can complain of insomnia. So we've talked a lot about obstructive sleep apnea. Um, why is it so important? And I've alluded that to that a little bit uh, with relation to the cardiovascular risk. Um, so we know that people who have um, severe obstructive sleep apnea uh, and moderately severe obstructive sleep apnea certainly have all-cause mortality, so uh, an increased risk of dying for any reason, much greater than people who have lower um, uh, obstructive sleep apnea scores. Um, and he, this busy table is just showing you that from a number of different studies all around the world, when we look at really um, important problems like stroke, heart disease, high blood pressure, um, uh, problems with insulin and diabetes, problems with um, abnormal heart rhythms, arrhythmias, there's certainly an increased risk compared to people who don't have um, sleep apnea uh, with these conditions. So it's certainly something that we, we want to make sure we pick up so we can try and help uh, prevent some of these risks. Uh, CPAP therapy is often one of the things that we recommend for patients who've got obstructive sleep apnea. So there's two photos here, uh, his and her CPAP machines. Uh, you can see that there's a box that sits by the bedside uh, and then a long tube that goes to a mask that goes on people's face. Uh, now these two um, uh, people both have uh, masks that go over their whole faces, but there's um, many, many different types of masks. And, uh, and one of the things we do spend a lot of time on is making sure that people get the right mask for their face shape. Um, and I've mentioned face shape is a big um, uh, contributor to sleep apnea in a lot of conditions. So there's many different types. And basically the way these machines work is blowing air in to try and hold open that windpipe so that the oxygen can get down. And then these people can get a better night's sleep. And we've got evidence, again, from a number of trials showing that using CPAP in people who've got um, sleep apnea um, have improvement in their sleepiness scores, improvement in their blood pressure scores, improved insulin resistance, so less likelihood of diabetes, uh, and some um, smaller trials showing some improvement in risk of stroke. So certainly we, th we have evidence to show that if we treat severe sleep apnea, uh, we improve people's profiles with those risks I just mentioned. David, I've, I've just talked about CPAP a little bit, um, the masking and machine, but are there some other options that patients can use if they've got sleep apnea? Yeah, there are a lot of op options in terms of treating sleep apnea, and what options we use just depends on how bad the sleep apnea is. Mm -hmm. So if sleep apnea is severe, really then CPAP is the option that we use. Mm -hmm. But if sleep apnea is relatively mild or moderate, 
The, the other options are things like a dental appliance, so that's called a mandibular advancement splint, a device that fits in the top and bottom teeth, and the aim is to bring the lower jaw forward, which in, in turn brings the tongue away from the back of the airway and opens up the airway. Another option is looking at surgery. So surgery can be used to reduce the soft tissues in the upper airway. So things like taking out the tonsils, removing the adenoids. We do tend to do that much more in young people than older people, because mm -hmm. it seems to make a difference, particularly in kids and adolescents, but less of a dif difference in adults. There's some other surgery on the palate or reducing the size of the tongue um, that can be used. And another treatment's a thing called Provent, some nasal valves. So there are adhesive valves that sit on the nostrils uh, that increase the pressure in the back of the airway. Mm -hmm. And that can act in some respects a bit like CPAP, but rather than having to be connected to a machine, they're little valves that sit on the nose. They can be a bit fiddly and don't work for everybody, but that's another option that we'll sometimes use. And then rarely for people, if it's trouble just uh, when they're sleeping on their back, we'll keep them off their back, so use a positional device so that people are just are sleeping on their side rather than on their back. And of course there's the general measures about making sure weight uh, isn't an issue mm -hmm. um, and ensuring that the nose is nice and open and people aren't getting a blocked nose. Yeah. And in patients who've got pituitary disorders and sleep apnea or you know any sleep problems in particular, there's some specific things that you, you sort of see a little bit more commonly causing troubles with getting established on therapies? Yeah, it can be that nasal congestion. That, mm -hmm. So that can be an issue, particularly in people with pituitary problems. Yeah. Sometimes if the pituitary problems are related to craniofacial abnormalities, it causes the nose to be narrow at the back. Mm -hmm. um, or other times it can be just nasal congestion that we need to deal with, like a non-allergic rhinitis yeah. um, that we need to deal with. And also in people with pituitary problems, some of the problems we get is a partial response to treatment. So if mm -hmm. the main response people are after is, I want to feel less tired during the day, Often the sleep problem's only part of it. There are other aspects of their pituitary condition that's going to make them a bit more tired. So yes, we'll manage the sleep apnea or we'll manage the insomnia, but it's not expecting that's going to be all of the problem and necessarily fix all of people's tiredness symptoms. So it's often more than one thing going on. Yeah. yeah. So I talked a bit about the circadian rhythm before. That's at the, the master body clock. And... Uh, Sunlight is really crucial in, in triggering off these symptoms. So in the back of our eyes, we have some receptors uh, that um, then trigger off signals down to the pineal gland, uh, that master hormone secreting gland I mentioned. And uh, that secretes a, a hormone called melatonin. Um, and that has influences in the hypothalamus to uh, override those switches of day and night um, with the, the 24 hour day night cycle. Um, also um, meant, um, influences the release of other hormones like cortisol and influences uh, things like body temperature. So it's a very important master switch in the whole body. And we sometimes see people who have um, from mass effects uh, with big pituitary glands squashing that poor little pineal gland, uh, troubles with their body clocks. So here's an example of a, what we call a sleep diary. So this is where um, our patient... Um, for different days of the week has noted down and, and shaded in boxes when um, they're asleep and a normal one we'd usually pretty much go to bed around the same time and pretty much wake up after a similar amount of time but this person here has had um, you can see over the time them getting uh, their bedtime getting later and later and that's because that body clock isn't sending off that master signal switch um, at the same time, this person's got a problem with their body clock. So changing tact a little bit, what about sleep disorders and how they inf influence the pituitary? Well, we know that um, many people have got severe obstructive sleep apnea, have reduced libido, and people have looked into why that might be and found that some of the sex hormones such as testosterone and one of the precursors, the luteinizing hormone, um, in men is certainly a lot lower if they've got uncontrolled severe obstructive sleep apnea, even when you control for um, things like being overweight uh, and other precursors that are, uh, can influence testosterone. The good news is if we can get people on um, appropriate therapy, for example, the CPAP, the mask and machine, um, those levels of testosterone have been shown to improve over time. So certainly there's influences both ways. So 
in summary, there's certainly are lots of links between pituitary disorders and sleep disorders. Um, sleep disorders are common, especially in people who've got pituitary disorders. Um, they are a little bit more complicated. Uh, there's often an increased impact because there's other reasons for having difficulties such as tiredness. Um, and there's certainly um, common links with cardiovascular risi- risks and disease. So it's really important for people who've got pituitary disorders uh, to be screened for sleep disorders, um, particularly obstructive sleep apnea in people who've got acromegaly and Cushing's disease. Um, So we always like to help um, uh, GPs and endocrinologists and anyone involved in the care of people who've got pituitary disorders uh, to keep um, sleep disorders, um, particularly sleep apnea, in mind. Well, I hope that was helpful information for everyone, a bit about the combination of problems that uh, pituitary disorders and sleep problems can lead to. Thanks for all the work you put into that, Claire. I think that's been a really helpful explanation uh, for people. And if people are looking for more information, there's the resources at the Australian Pituitary Foundation uh, or also resources about sleep on the Sleep Hub website. For the A to Z of sleeping well, head to the hub, sleephub.com.au.